Hello, Sabona, Dumelang, Huyamora, Buenas noches. Hello, everybody. Dr. Ryan here. Thanks for joining me, even as we cover another clinical topic in internal medicine. This time, we're approaching our beloved pericardial effusion. Okay, we're going to be covering a clinical case as always, and then we're going to tease apart pericardial effusion, looking at the different etiologies, the clinical features, investigations, treatment and having a look at the technique behind pericardiocentesis. And then we're going to look at cardiac tamponade and briefly discuss clinical features and treatment, closing off with scripture. Thank you for joining me. I hope you're well. Here is our handy clinical case, as usually the case. So we have uh, Mr. Hartoff, who is a 45-year-old man undergoing treatment for metastatic adenocarcinoma of unknown primary origin. He is admitted with a problem of acute dyspnea. Ooh, taking his breath away, oh dear. On arrival, he is in distress. He is hypotensive with a blood pressure of 70 over 30, tachycardic at 140 beats per minute. The jugular veins are distended and his lungs are clear. The ECG demonstrates low QRS voltage and sinus tachy. And you have to actually strain to hear his very quiet heart sounds on precardial auscultation. Which of the following is likely to be decreased in this patient? Is it A, interpericardial pressure, B, uh, jugular venous pressure, C, left atrial pressure? Is it D, left ventricular end diastolic pressure, or is it E, left ventricular end diastolic volume? Hmm. Okay, guys, we've covered this before, but let's just quickly run through this. Pericarditis has numerous underlying etiologies, all right? And we can certify them into different categories, infectious, malignant, uh, uh, connective tissue diseases, cardiac, metabolic, and others. So under infectious, we have viral, bacterial, fungal, of which the most common, guys, is tuberculosis worldwide. Right, uh, malignancy can be metastatic, reactive, or primary. Then we have the family of connective tissue issues, the likes of rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, and so forth. Then we have the cardiac, uh, group, the metabolic group, and others. Alrighty. So, in terms of pericardial effusion specifically, now remember that pericardial disease is a spectrum and a stepwise progression. So, initially, you have acute pericarditis, which then from there you can develop pericardial effusion, and later on, the more chronic form is constrictive pericarditis. So, we've covered constrictive pericarditis. I will uh, release a video soon on uh, acute pericarditis, but this specific video is addressing pericardial effusion. Okay, so the cause of pericardial effusion, remember there's a, a visceral pericardium and a parietal pericardium, and you've got fluid in there. If the fluid accumulates in that potential space, that's what we call pericardial effusion. So it can develop following uh, acute infective pericarditis, be it bacterial, viral, right? Tuberculosis, you know, is very common. Collagen diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus, the wolf, Ow! Cardiac causes like post myocardial infarct or post cardiotomy or restless syndrome, right, which complicates uh, myocardial infarct chronically. Uh, myxedema, lymphoma, it could be a neoplasm being a secondary uh, from carcinoma of the breast or a bronchial CA, can be uh, something which occurs as a complication of dialysis during CKD or AKI when you're dialyzing the patient the setting aortic aneurysm, other causes of being trauma and after radiotherapy. Guys, what are the clinical signs of a pericardial effusion? So looking at the pulse, it usually because you've got this layer of fluid which is sitting around the myocardium, compressing it, you have a low volume pulse, tachycardia, there may be pulses paradoxes. Now, please tell why do you get pulses paradoxes? So we all know that when you breathe in, your intrathoracic volume is increasing and your intrathoracic pressure decreases, which means that there's going to be pooling of blood in pulmonary circulation. So venous return to the left side of the heart is impeded, but uh, venous return to the right side of the heart is enhanced. So when you breathe in, remember that filling of the right ventricle is going to be en uh, enhanced. If you have a pericardial effusion, what happens is that the right side of the heart is going to expand, or the right ventricle is going to expand, pushing that septum to the left. When that happens, it, that diminishes left ventricular outflow, and that manifests with a diminished volume pulse and a reduction in your pulse pressure by more than 10 mils mercury on inspiration. Alrighty. Um, 
Job number unit's pressure is going to be raised and the customer sign is positive, which speaks to a rise in the job number unit's pressure on inspiration. Normally what happens when you breathe in, into the thoracic volume increases, into the thoracic pressure decreases, and right side heart filling is enhanced and the JVP falls. But when there's constricted pericarditis or even when there's pericardial effusion, the opposite happens. So when you breathe in, the JVP goes up and that is what we term Kussmaul's sign. Now, the raised JVP may also demonstrate a sharp rise and a wide descent, something we call a Friedrich sign. Looking at the blood pressure, you may have low systolic, normal diastolic, and a narrow pulse pressure. Right In the precordium, we know that the apex is difficult to palpate, obvious, because you have that pericardial fluid which is accumulating abnormally, so compressing the uh, uh, ventricles. Now, if the apex is palpable, it is within the area of cardiac dullness. The area of cardiac dullness is increased on percussion, but not that reliable a sign to elicit. Heart sounds are muffled or distant, and the bronchial sound may be heard, bronchial breathing at the left inferior angle of the scapula. That's what we call Ewart's sign. Alrighty, the liver is enlarged and tender. How you can investigate pericardial effusion? A good place to start is with the chest X-ray, uh, posterior anterior view. What you can see is cardiomegaly, a globular pear-shaped heart with clear margin and oligemic lung fields. Right, you do your full blood count and your ESR, that's going to be high. If it's high, you're thinking about some inflammatory process, it can be infective, like maybe it's tuberculous pericardial effusion, maybe it's lupus behind that. The ECG as well, we're going to see an example, is to show you a low voltage tracing and tachycardia, and sometimes you have this phenomenon we call electrical alternance. All right, let's just move this out of the way. Echocardiogram is going to show an echo-free zone with a color Doppler demonstrating uh, increased flow through the tricuspid and pulmonary valves, decreased flow through the mitral valve during inspiration. I think the money-throwing investigation, guys, is pericardiocentesis. Uh, what you want to do is you want to see the physical characteristics of the fluid. Just like when we're doing an acidic tap or a pleural tap, you want to macroscopically just inspect that fluid and check what's the color. Is it straw-colored? Is it hemorrhagic? Is it turbid? Then you want to send the fluid off to the lab for analysis. You're sending the pericardial fluid off to ascertain the etiology. And good test to do, uh, it will be a gram stain, cytology, biochemistry, looking at your protein, looking at your glucose, um, and looking at your LDH. Uh, culture and sensitivity, send it off with acephosbacillae or adenosine deaminase, ADA, which if above 40 would speak to TB, um, malignant cells as well. So send it off for cytology. Okay, so this is an X-ray uh, demonstrating what we just discussed, right? So you can see a big old, uh, you know, globular heart, a very globular heart, and relatively oligemic lung fields, right? And look how the, uh, yeah, so that's basically that. That speaks to a pericardial effusion. And this is the phenomenon of electrical alternance. So we see alternating strong and weak beats. So this is weak, this is strong. This is weak, this is strong, based on the size of the QRS. But in general, all the QRS complexes are smaller than that which you would expect, but you have the alternating strong and weak beat because that beautiful ventricular myocardium is uh, beating uh, to and fro in this whole mass of pericardial fluid. So strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak. All right. Uh, then going on with further investigations, you may want to do a cardiac CT or a cardiac MRI, which is helpful to see if you're dealing with hemopericardium or a loculated pericardial effusion. Other investigations according to what you suspect to be the cause. So if you're thinking TB, it's prudent to do your uh, urine lamb if the CD4 is below 200 in the patient who's rich survival positive. Do your sputum, your gene expert, and acephas bacilli. You can do your collagen disease screen in the way of rheumatoid factor, anti-nuclear factor, anti-double standard DNA, and extractable nuclear antigens. Hypothyroidism, remember myxedema can cause pericardial effusion. You want to do a thyroid function test essentially. If there's any palpable lymph nodes, you want to biopsy those. Okay, so what are the findings in tuberculous pericardial effusion? So TB, as you know, is very common here in sub-Saharan Africa, right? So if you do a pericardial synthesis and you look at the, that pericardial fluid macroscopically, it's straw-colored. Cytology would give you a high lymphocyte uh, pleocytosis. Biochemistry would demonstrate high protein with a low sugar. Your adenosine deaminase is high, typically over 40 units per liter. And, and you can actually isolate that organism from pericardial fluid either by acephosbacilli staining, but the yield is not that great. It's positive in about 25% of cases. Uh, culture, and of course, the gold standard is gene export, where you do a PCR 
and you show and you see the actual uh, DNA of uh, TB. Remember that to increase your yield on the fluid, the pericardial fluid, or any fluid, even pleural fluid, or acidic tap, acidic fluid, you can ask the lab to spin it down. You spin it, you centrifuge it, and then you analyze the supernatant. Right, that will increase your uh, yield substantially. How do we treat pericardial effusion, everybody? So if there's TB on board, you want to administer anti-TB treatment with prednisolone. Alrighty. Uh, so there was a trial called the MP trial that looked uh, basically at whether we should add and stick steroids on top of TB treatment based on whether the patient's HIV positive or HIV negative, right? So the, the outcome of the trial showed that um, this actually was beneficial in the group that did not have HIV, right? But in the group that did have HIV, adding steroids on top of the TB treatment did not influence outcomes. If anything, it actually increased the likelihood of malignancy, especially Kaposi sarcoma, right? That was the MP trial. So if there's bacterial cause, uh, you want to use broad spectrum antibiotics and you also want to address the primary cause, whatever the etiology is. If there's hypothyroidism, you start ultroxin, right? If there's lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, you start your necessary treatment. If it's lymphoma, chemo, radiotherapy, staging. And of course, pericardiosynthesis, <coughs> I'm sorry, with the patient does develop cardiac tamponade. What are the causes of a recurrent pericardial effusion? It doesn't give up. It keeps on coming back. What is wrong with this? Outline your management. This is most likely attributable to malignancy, but may also occur in chronic kidney disease on account of uremia. In such cases, the following treatments are given. Pericardial fenestration, right? So refer to cardiothoracics for this. This is basically the creation of a window in the pericardium. It is done to allow slow release of fluid in the surrounding tissue. Surgical drainage or partial pericardiectomy may also be necessary. Okay, guys, how do we actually do pericardiosynthesis? So ideally, it is done under ultrasonographic or echocardiographic guidance. Uh, so we often use, you know, the normal the central line kit, so a CVP insertion kit. So that's what we normally do locally. So you use a CVP needle, right, and you insert it. You can infiltrate with local anesthetic. I'll show you the, the landmark just now. You, you're going to go through the left costoxiphoid junction, direct the needle upward, backward, and towards the left shoulder. It may also be introduced lateral to the apex beat. All right. So this is essentially how you're going to do it. And right? so this is our, uh, so the different approaches, right? So you can go uh, the parasternal approach, which is uh, not very common, but we use the substernal approach, this one, right? So you aim just beneath the Zephi process and you aim towards the, the right shoulder, essentially. And you're going to go in under ultrasonographic or echocardiographic guidance until you get a flash of pericardial fluid in your syringe, right? Uh, the apical method is also used as well. Remember, you've got to infiltrate with local anesthetic just before. And it's also prudent after you drain the fluid, if you want to keep a catheter in, you can use a Sardinger technique, just like how you insert a central line, essentially, right? What are the complications of pericardial synthesis? So you can cause injury to the coronary artery and vessels. You can uh, cause an arrhythmia, so it's good to also do it under ECG guidance, and bleeding, which may aggravate cardiac tamponade. What is cardiac tamponade? It is a state of compression of the heart in a rapidly developing pericardial effusion. It interferes with diastolic filling, so the, car, the heart can't relax. You know, nobody ever said, relax, when you tell them to relax, and the poor heart can't relax, and the patient develops features of shock. Oh dear, it's a shocking situation. If there's rapid accumulation of fluid, even 200 mls can cause tamponade. So the tempo of fluid accumulation is important. However, if there's slow, grumbling, chronic, long-standing accumulation of fluid, even up to 2 liters of fluid may be required for cardiac tamponade. So it's, it's not just the total amount of fluid accumulation, it's also the tempo with which that fluid accumulates that determines whether or not a pericardial effusion becomes tamponade. So this is a beautiful cartoon from makecomic.com. Thank you so much, Mr. Muniz and company. So here, this illustrates cardiac tamponade, okay? So we can see the clinical features, we call it what we term Bix triad, but this is muffled, so it's mixed triad. <laughs> Distended neck veins, muffled heart sounds, and hypotension makes your triad. I think he means big triad, definitely. 
and this accumulation of fluid in the pericardial sac which impairs diastolic filling so you can't relax and diminishes cardiac output okay what are the causes of cardiac tamponade it can be on account of trauma or cardiac surgery which indeed is going to cause um, hemopericardium malignancy in that repetitive effusions may occur myocardial rupture the sitting aortic aneurysm sometimes any cause of pericardial effusion may indeed result in tamponade. What are the features of cardiac tamponade? We've already touched on this. So we have uh, symptoms. The patient may complain of heaviness or compression within the chest, palpitations, dyspnea, and you have features of shock, right? So hypotension, tachycardia, and the signs of what we term big triad. We covered this in the cartoon. Hypotension, raised JVP, muffled heart sounds. Other features as well as for pericardial effusion. How are you going to treat the cardiac tamponade? There's no other treatment right, except pericardiocentesis initially, and then you want to address the primary etiology. So guys, coming back to our clinical case, Mr. Hartsoff, 45-year-old male, normal metastatic adenocea of uh, prim unknown primary, right? He has acute dyspnea, he's hypotensive, he's tachycardic, his JVP is distended, his lungs are clear, ECG shows low QRS voltages, sinus tachy, distant heart sounds. What is likely to be decreased in this patient? Drum roll, please. Thrrr. Indeed, it is left ventricular end diastolic volume. Alrighty. So let's look at the explanation. Mr. Hartoff indeed has cardiac tamponade. The classic presentation is what we term Bix triad, which is consistent and typical. Now, in this patient, the pericardial effusion likely is neoplastic given his known adenocarcinoma of unknown primary. In tamponade, the interpericardial volume rises due to the gathering effusion at a certain volume which is determined by number one, pericardial compliance, number two, uh, tempo or rate at which the effusion gathers. The pressure rises quickly and will begin to compress those cardiac chambers and impede filling. Thus, as your interpericardial pressure increases, intercardiac chamber pressure also increases while volumes decline. The raised JVP is simply a reflection of your elevated right atrial pressure. Okay, while we're talking about pericarditis, what does the Bible have to say about the heart? Hmm, nice to ask. Right, Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Some uh, uh, versions would say flow the issues of life. Indeed, God has given us one heart, and this scripture can be interpreted from both the physiological context and a spiritual context. Guard your heart because it's important to maintain good cardiovascular health. Stop smoking, exercise regularly, eat right, okay. Um, if you have any chronic conditions, manage those. But also guard your heart from a spiritual context because the heart speaks of your emotion, your will, and your volition, right? Your, your, your mind, essentially. We should, we should keep that um, obedient to the Holy Spirit in all things, and He will direct our steps. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and by your fruit you shall know them. I pray our hearts may be in tune with the Lord. These are my references. I'll see you soon. We'll be talking next time about acute pericarditis. Have yourself a great day. I'll see you soon.